Good morning, Brookwood. I am so, so grateful that we can be here together. I'm grateful that I can be here with you, both those of you who are in the room and those of you who are joining us on our online campus. It's good that we can come together in different ways during these difficult times. Today we are continuing our summer series called Believe in God as we walk through the heroes of faith that are described in Hebrews 11. Now, they're not heroes because they were perfect. They're not heroes because they always did the right thing. But these people are recorded as heroes of faith because at pivotal moments in their lives, they obeyed and trusted God. That's been true for every person that we've looked at in Hebrews 11, from Abel to Moses last week. But today, we're going to look at a group of people, the first and only time that a group of people are listed for their faith, and that is the nation of Israel. The title of today's message is called The Possibility of Faith, not whether faith itself is possible, but rather what becomes possible when we live a life of faith. Now, if you know anything about the history of Israel, you may be surprised that they made the list because Israel has a history of failing again and again and again. Sometimes Israel really struggled with their faith and other times they abandoned it completely. They don't really sound like heroes of faith, do they? Yet they're listed here in the book of Hebrews as a community because when they did move together forward in faith, incredible, impossible things happened. And when we struggle in our faith, we should remember that God wants to do incredible, impossible things in our lives. And when we look at our church, we should recognize that God wants to do incredible, impossible things through our church. Write this in your message outline or in your notes. Faith sees the impossible become possible. Faith sees the impossible become possible. Do you want to see God do incredible, impossible things in your life? That's not very many of you. Do you want to see God do incredible, miraculous, impossible things in your life? Do you want to see God do incredible, miraculous things through us as a church? then we must seek a life of faith together. We have to pursue Christ and God's purpose for us as a community of believers. Let's jump into our text. We last left off in Hebrews 11, verse 29, verse 29. If you are using the Bible here in the room that is available here at Brookwood, that is on page 972, 972. And if you're joining us in our online campus, you can just click the Bible tab in your chat window and you can follow along there. But we are in Hebrews 11, verse 29. It was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea as though they were on dry ground. But when, they, when the Egyptians tried to follow them, they were all drowned. It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days and the walls came crashing down. So the author of Hebrews points out two major events in the history of Israel. The crossing of the Red Sea as they leave Egypt and the fall of Jericho when they enter the Promised Land. Two circumstances where faith saw the impossible become possible. We'll look at each one. The first impossibility that faith offers us is this. Through faith, we experience impossible rescue. Through faith, we experience impossible rescue. 1129 again. It was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea as though they were on dry ground. But when the Egyptians tried to follow, they were all drowned. Now, I don't want you to miss the significance of the fact that this is in the book of Hebrews. Remember, 
the author of Hebrews is writing to Jewish believers who have accepted Jesus as the Messiah, Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus the Messiah. The author is taking lessons of faith from the most revered men and women in the Torah, which to us is the first five books of the Old Testament, and he's applying those lessons of faith from their heroes to their new faith in Jesus Christ as Jews. So when we read about the miracle of the Red Sea parting, we think it is miraculous. We say, that's incredible. But try to grasp what the original Jewish readers would have felt when they came across that sentence in that letter. This is the most significant event in the Jewish Scriptures. Don't miss this. The parting of the Red Sea is as precious to a Jew as the resurrection is to us. So when the author of Hebrews ties the miracle of the Red Sea to our faith in Jesus Christ, it is an invitation to these Jewish believers to the most profound intimacy with God. It would have been emotional and powerful for them to read when they came to this sentence. So let's try to honor that in our own hearts as we walk through this this morning. Now, last week when J.C. talked about the faith of Moses, he described the final plague that God sent to Egypt. And that final plague is what led the Pharaoh to let the people of God leave, to abandon slavery and leave Egypt. The descendants of Abraham had been enslaved for 400 years, and now they're finally leaving Egypt. But Pharaoh had a habit of changing his mind. And so in Exodus 14, that's exactly what happens. Now, I wish that we had time to read the entire chapter. We don't this morning. So I'm going to encourage you to do that on your own this week. Read all of Exodus 14 and also Joshua 6. But let me highlight a few things as we go along. If you are using the Bible that we have here at Brookwood, I'm on page 59. So the Israelites have packed up and they have started their journey out of Egypt. But Pharaoh and his officials decide to take every available chariot, every available horse, every available soldier in the most powerful nation on earth, hunt down their slaves and bring them back. So God leads the Israelites to a very specific place on the edge of the Red Sea where they seem trapped. They are trapped with the Red Sea in front of them, mountains on both sides, and an army barreling down on them from behind. I think George Lucas stole this scene for Star Wars, didn't he? The rebel Israelists are like, it's a trap! And the Pharaoh's barreling down on them in his TIE fighter chariot going, I have you now. There are more Star Wars fans on that side, apparently. No, this is an impossible situation. And the Israelites begin to complain to Moses because complaining is what Israelites do best. They begin to complain to Moses. They say, why did you bring us here to die? We could have died in Egypt. Why did you bring us here to die? But even in their fear and even in their complaining, the Israelites do one thing right. Exodus 14.10. As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and they panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. They cried out to the Lord. They cried out to the Lord. And even though they were frightened, even though they were complaining to Moses, God responded. God responded to the glimmer of faith that they showed in calling out to him. And Moses said, Moses told the people, don't be afraid, just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians that you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just 
stay calm. Have you ever been in a situation where you felt paralyzed by your circumstances? Have you ever felt like there was nowhere to go? Do you feel like you are trapped on all sides with your circumstances bearing down on you? Listen, in the panic of your impossibilities, don't forget that the Lord himself will fight for you. And look what God says to Moses. He says, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. Pick up your staff and raise your hand over the sea. Divide the water so the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. I love that God basically tells them to stop whining and get moving. And we can each decide if there's an application there for us in our own lives. And then the angel of the Lord moved from the front of the Israel camp to the back of the Israel camp overnight. And as night fell, the Lord appeared between the two camps as a pillar of fire between the Egyptians and the Israelites, keeping them safe. And when Moses raised his hand, an east wind blew, and the wind blew all night, and it parted the Red Sea. And then the Israelites began to cross the dry seabed with water towering over them on each side. And you might say, Josh, how is that faith? How is that faith? They had nowhere else to go. They were complaining the whole time. That's true. But do you know when my faith became real? When I had nowhere else to go. Remember, the only assurance that these Israelites had that this water wasn't going to come crashing down on them when they got halfway across the sea, the only assurance they had was God's promise. And if they weren't showing faith in that moment, it wouldn't be listed in Hebrews 11. Sometimes faith means moving forward in God's promise even when you're afraid. Sometimes we move forward in faith towards God's promise, even when we're afraid. God had been working on their behalf the whole time. They just couldn't see it. They didn't start seeing how God was working for them until they started moving forward in faith. And that's when they saw how God was fighting for them. Once they started across the sea on the dry riverbed, the Egyptians started to follow, but the Lord confuses the army. He twists their chariot wheels. He prevents them from catching up to the Israelites. And we all know that once the Israelites safely reached the other side, the waters came crashing down on the Egyptians and they were all washed out to the sea. The section that we're studying in Hebrews is all about faith and a record of faith. So I think that it is significant that the author of Hebrews not only highlights how the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, but he adds that when the Egyptians tried to follow, they all drowned. This passage is about faith. He could have stopped where it said, by faith they crossed the Red Sea. Why include this? I think he's including the part about the Egyptians because I think the author of Hebrews is not only commenting on the faith of Israel, but the lack of faith in Egypt. Look at what the Egyptians say in the middle of the miracle. They're surrounded by God's miracle, and look at what they say just before they drown. This is the last thing that they say. Let's get out of here. Away from, the, is, away from these Israelites, the Egyptians shouted, the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. And where it says Lord, they actually use the personal name of God. What the Hebrew says is the Egyptians said, let's get out of here. Yahweh is fighting for the Israelites against Egypt. In their final moments, the Egyptians recognized the one true God, but they still rejected him. I wonder what might have happened 
if once they recognized him, they called out to him instead of fleeing him. Knowing who God is and having faith in him are not the same thing. The Israelites were fleeing evil and God provided an impossible rescue. They were fleeing evil, but they were also moving toward God's promise. And that brings us to our second impossibility that faith offers. Through faith, we experience impossible results. Impossible results. And in your notes, whether it's in a notebook or on the outline or in your app, if you're joining us in the online campus, in your notes, I want you to write this next to the word results. Impossible results, victory, and triumph. Because when we move toward the promises of God in faith, we see impossible results in our lives, impossible victory in our battles, and impossible triumph in our purpose. And that is what the author of Hebrews addresses next in verse 30. He writes this, It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days, and the walls came crashing down. God had made a promise to the children of Abraham more than 500 years earlier, and finally, finally, this was the moment. The fall of Jericho was to be the first stop in the fulfillment of God's promise inside the promised land. And we're going to cover this in more detail next week. We're going to come back to the story of Joshua next week. But Jericho was already terrified of the Israelites when they arrived. They had heard about the Red Sea. They had heard what the God of Israel had done for them in the desert. And they were terrified, so they locked themselves up inside their city and they fortified their walls. They locked themselves in. So Israel comes out of the desert, God parts the Jordan Sea or the Jordan River just as He parted the Red Sea for Moses, and they are prepared to go to war, ready to claim the promises of God. So the Jordan parts, they march in, and Israel takes the city, right? No. Joshua chapter 5. Watch this. This is amazing. When Joshua was near the town of Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and he demanded, are you friend or are you foe? Neither one, he replied. I am the commander of the Lord's army. And at this, Joshua fell on his face to the ground in reverence. I am at your command, Joshua said. What do you want your servant to do? And the commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals. For the ground you're standing on is holy. And Joshua did what he said. Now, pretty much every biblical scholar agrees that Joshua is having a direct physical encounter with Jesus Christ. Because this can't be an angel, can it? Angels don't accept worship. And this man not only accepts Joshua's worship, but he commands it. Where else do we see someone told to take off their sandals because they're standing on holy ground? Moses at the burning bush. Right? Joshua is standing before the Lord Jesus himself. And I think that there's a real lesson in what the Lord says to Joshua when Joshua asks his question. Joshua says, are you friend or foe? In other translations, it says, are you for me or are you for my enemies? And the Lord says, neither. I am the commander of the Lord's army. 
In other words, the Lord is not beholden to any earthly orders. See, what Joshua was essentially asking this man is, are you my soldier or are you their soldier? And Jesus says, neither. I'm no one's soldier. You're my soldier. And Joshua fell to his knees in worship. In the battle of our lives, we must be very, very careful how we approach God with that question. Because sometimes when we look at God and we say, God, are you for me or are you against me? What we're really asking are, God, are you ready to serve me? I love this story. During the Civil War, when Abraham Lincoln was leading our nation in a fight against the horrific sin of slavery and racism. He was at the White House, and a pastor, a pastor, approached the president, and he said, I hope that the Lord is on our side. And the president corrected that pastor. The man said, I hope that the Lord is on our side. And Abraham Lincoln responded, I am not at all concerned about that. For I know that the Lord is always on the side of right. But it is my constant anxiety and prayer that I and this nation be on the Lord's side. There are too many people today that are claiming God in their agenda. And we need to start making sure that we are on the Lord's side instead of inscripting Him to be on ours. We need that in our nation and we need that in our church. God fought for the Israelites at the Red Sea. He fought for them at Jericho. He will fight for you. He is for you. Scripture says, if God is for you, who can be against you? Romans 8, 31. But we must be diligent. We must be sure in making sure that we are on his mission and not forcing him to join ours. We must make sure that we are listening for God's direction at the base of the wall he said was going to fall rather than demanding I'd conquer a wall of our choosing. There are many of us here today that are standing at walls that are never going to fall because you chose the wall and God didn't. And meanwhile, we're missing the victory that he has for us over at this wall. So the Lord doesn't tell Joshua to lead the armies of Israel to tear down the walls of Jericho. The Lord says he will fulfill his own promise. Joshua's interaction continues in chapter 6. Now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelites. No one was allowed to go in or out. But the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king and all its strong warriors. You and your fighting men should march around the town once a day for six days. It was about a mile around the city, depending on, of course, how far away from the wall they were marching. Seven priests will walk ahead of the ark, each carrying a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you are to march around the town seven times with the priests blowing their horns. When you hear the priests give one long blast on the ram's horns, have all the people shout as loud as they can. Then, the walls of the town will collapse and the people can charge straight into the town. That is a weird plan, right? But look at how it engages their faith. First, the Lord says, I have given you Jericho. Past tense. It's already done. The outcome is decided. Second, 
when are they commanded to give the victory shout? Right after the wall falls, right? No, just before the wall falls. Faith comes before the impossible. Because faith is not the result of miracles. Miracles are the result of faith. Can you start to celebrate the victory of God's promise to you before the walls of your circumstances fall? Because in both examples that we see here in Hebrews, the faith of Israel is exalted not only for their belief in what the outcome was going to be, but for their obedience to God's direction leading up to the outcome. And so the Israelites prepare to receive God's victory before they can see it. They march around the city once every day for six days with the Ark of the Covenant leading them. And, and the Ark of the Covenant is, it represents God's presence with them. Joshua 6.15 On the seventh day, the Israelites got up at dawn and marched around the town as they had done before. But this time, they went around the town seven times. The seventh time around, the priests sounded the long blast on their horns, and Joshua commanded the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the town. Skipping down to verse 20. When the people heard the sound of the ram's horn, they shouted as loud as they could, and suddenly the walls of Jericho collapsed, and the Israelites charged straight into the town and captured it. And that's exactly what the Lord said was going to happen at the beginning of the chapter. Remember, he said, the walls of the town will collapse and the people can charge straight into the town. Now, the NLT says straight into. They went straight into the town. If you look at the Hebrew, what it actually says is each one went straight up into the city. Each one went straight up into the city. And that may not seem like a big difference. But there have been several major archaeological digs on Jericho. The first one was in the 1930s. Now, there's a little bit of debate among archaeologists about the date of Jericho's destruction. But what there is no debate about, what every archaeological dig has found is that the destruction and the burning of Jericho perfectly matches the description in Scripture. And what every archaeological dig has found is that somehow the walls of the city seem to have simply fallen straight down. They weren't pushed in by an army. They fell straight down. The whole wall around the whole city, except for one tiny section, remains standing, and that's going to be important to us next week. Look at this diagram. Around the whole city, there was this stone retaining wall. It was 15 feet high. And above that, there was another wall that was 12 feet high and 6 feet deep. That's 27 feet. But when the walls collapsed, archaeologists have discovered that somehow they fell straight down, creating a ramp for the Israelites to march into the city. They went straight up into the city and took it. Faith sees the impossible become possible. When we flee from evil, we see impossible rescue. When we march toward God's promises, we see impossible results. But there's an even greater impossibility that we experience in faith, greater than those two. It is subtle, and it's easy to miss. But I think that there's something else significant about the account of Israel's faith in the book of Hebrews. Let's look. Turn back to Hebrews. Let's look at what the author of Hebrews says about Israel between the faith they showed at the Red Sea and the faith 
that they showed at Jericho. Let's look at that verse. There's nothing there. That's not a typo, right, Alex? No, there's nothing there. There is no Hebrews 11, 29.5. And if you have your Bibles, I want you to highlight the space between those two verses and write the word promise. It is significant that there is nothing between those two verses. Because do you know how much time elapses between verses 29 and 30? Someone said it. 40 years. That small space between those two lines in your Bible represent 40 years. And there's nothing there because there was nothing of any significance to their faith in those 40 years. There is nothing in those 40 years as a community where they showed any faith at all. It was four decades of grumbling and disobedience. So here's the question. Are you caught between verses 29 and 30 in your faith today? Because Israel was supposed to cross the Red Sea, march across the desert, and take Jericho with Moses leading the way. That's what was supposed to happen. But they turned their back on God's promise. They rejected God's victory for fear. And the promise had to wait another 40 years. They'd been waiting 500 years. And now they have to wait another 40. They had experienced the miracle of the Red Sea. But when they reached the doorstep of the promised land, they refused to trust God. And because they refused to move forward, with the same faith, despite their fear. Fear wasn't the sin. They refused to move forward in faith the same way that they showed faith at the Red Sea. The fulfillment of God's promise was delayed yet another generation. But don't miss this. The real significance that we see in that in Hebrews 11 is not that there's nothing between verses 29 and 30. The real miracle is that God allowed there to be a verse 30 at all. They had abandoned God's promise for them. They had abandoned their purpose in God as a people, as a community. And God would have been right to abandon them. But there's a verse 30. Because through faith we experience impossible restoration. God's promise is greater than our failures. God didn't turn his back on Israel and he will not turn his back on you. And even as the Israelites wandered through the desert for 40 years in their grumbling and in their disobedience, God still provided for them. He protected them from their enemies. He protected them from poison. He miraculously gave them food every single day. And he kept their sandals from wearing out for 40 years. And he waited. He waited until he could fulfill his promise because God delights in fulfilling his promises. And maybe, maybe you think you've wandered too far. No. God is providing for you. Even if you don't see it, he's providing for you right now, and he is waiting for you to start walking toward his promise again. And I think that there's a reason that the Lord appears to Joshua using the exact same words that he used with Moses at the burning bush. I think there's a reason that the Lord parts the Jordan River for Joshua just like he parted the Red Sea for Moses, and it is not to elevate Joshua. It is a spiritual renewal. It is a reminder that the same God that led them out of Egypt is leading them now, and it's a reminder to us that that God that led them out of Egypt is leading us now. 
It is a reminder that God's covenant stands, and no matter how far we wander away from him, he waits patiently with open arms, ready to restore and renew the relationship and the promise as if we'd never fallen. And Israel's story is my story. You know, I I don't talk about this much, but I was called to the ministry when I was 14. I knew I was called to be a pastor at 14. And I never doubted he was God. I never doubted Jesus was salvation. I never doubted what I was supposed to be doing. But when I went off to college, I got an attitude and I told God, no. You can't make me. I will do what I want. (laughs) And I chose the world over God for 13 years as I defiantly threw away every promise that he had made to me. And you need to understand in this time, in this over a decade's time, there was not a single day that I doubted what I was supposed to be doing. I simply refused to do it. And when the bottom came, I thought I had wandered too far from God to get back to him. I shouldn't be here. There is no reason that God should allow me to speak to him, let alone talk to hundreds or thousands of people about him. There is no reason for me to be here. I shouldn't be here. But God's purpose is greater than our wandering. His promises are stronger than the lies we believe, and his restoration is more powerful than our disobedience. Maybe you need a do-over with God today. Maybe you need to return to the promise that he made to you years ago. Maybe your Red Sea was so long ago that you can't see the Jordan that he's trying to part for you right now. And it might seem impossible. In fact, it, it may be impossible. But faith sees the impossible become possible. Do you think your marriage is beyond repair? Faith sees the impossible become possible. Have you suffered so much trauma in your life that you think it's impossible for you to fully heal? Faith sees the impossible become impossible. Do you think you've wandered too far from God for him to want you? Faith sees the impossible become possible. No matter where you are, no matter what you have done, God wants to restore you and he wants to restore his relationship with you and he wants to fulfill his promises to you because the greatest possibility of faith is the never-ending hope of God's grace. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are a God of restoration, that you are a God of hope, that you are a God of healing, and that you are a God who makes the impossible possible. And Lord, I pray for us today, include me, that the enemy not steal this from our hearts, that you let us march out of this room and out of this church with hope and with understanding that you want to restore us, that you have a promise for us, that you have a purpose for us, and you have a purpose for us that is bigger than we imagine and bigger than ourselves. And I pray, Lord, that you would allow us to see that, that you would remove the scale from our eyes and that you would continue to speak to us throughout the week. Don't let us go back to our normal lives. Let us grab hold of this, what you're saying to us today. We give you praise, knowing that you stand with a sword ready to fight for us. Amen.